the first portion is going to be about an hour and we've got an hour of Paul's time and uh, he's our guest speaker today and with that in mind I'd like to move into Paul's presentation. First off it's great pleasure that I welcome Paul to our AGM. Uh, look forward Paul to your to your presentation and and the work that you've done in the past with us with the Children's Forest. Paul's currently somewhere on the west coast of Washington on the beach as you can see. Um, and so that hopefully isn't going to cause any technical issues, but we do have a plan B if that eventually does. As many as, we, as, many of you know, uh, Paul does uh, have a residence on Cortez. Paul is a renowned mycologist. And this past year, he worked with the Children's Forest to um, help us organize and participate in a micro blitz in the Children's Forest. And through that work, we were able to uh, document a significant amount of new species for us in the children's forest. So with that little introduction, I'd just like to pass it over to Paul. Welcome, Paul. And uh, the, uh, the mic is yours. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And good to see all of you. I really wish I was on Cortez. I'm right now at a, at a, a closed campground. <laughs> the sign said closed for camping, but they didn't say closed for visiting. So um, I'm, I'm we're here alone. Uh, fortunately, this is the only place we can get a signal right now. So I have two bars. I think I'll be able to drive my PowerPoint. So um, I thank you for this opportunity. This is a very short PowerPoint. It's only 35 slides, but I want to give you sort of a, a flavor of what we were doing, what we <coughs> have been doing. Um, and I think it opens up a lot of possibilities for the future. I'm very concerned about biodiversity mycodiversity in particular, biodiversity. We did a bio blitz, a myco blitz, um, thanks to Sabina and Christine's and Chris's uh, encouragement um, and others. Uh, we did our first COVID compliant uh, blitz um, at the Children's Forest. And so I wanna share some of what we experienced. I also uh, want to acknowledge, of course, the First Nations uh, who, came here first, you know, on this continent. Um, and I also want to acknowledge um, to, uh, two of my primary teachers, Dr. Michael Bug from the Evergreen State College and Catherine Skates. They took me under their wing when I was about 19, 20 years of age. And I'm carrying on th their tradition of teaching. Uh, and I, we are all threads in a fabric of knowledge that extends back through time. So many of these threads have been frayed and broken because of disease, war, religious persecution, uh, other problems. And it's amazing we have the knowledge that we have today. So I want to continue to be a person and one voice in a long history of people going into the future of being able to share the excitement and knowledge about these fungi, which are so, I think, so important uh, for our ecosystems and for uh, the health of the commons. So I'm gonna jump in and try to share a screen now um, and hopefully, can everybody see that? That's visible now. Thumbs up if you can see it. Can you see it? Okay, good. All right, good. Thank you. Um, you're on mute, so it's kind of hard to get a response. Um, so we did a we did a, this Michael Blitz, um, you know, at the Children's Forest, uh, and we um, oh, let's see how this is going to work. Okay, Pam, there it goes. All right, good. So we identified 66 species, uh, 23 new species were added uh, in the mycoblist from the previous records. Uh, Connie uh, Drombowski, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce her name, um, has been a resident you know, mycologist there, has also been contributing. So we create these species lists um, and there's many changes in the names and taxonomy, the DNA uh, amplification is showing convergent and divergent evolution. It's really extraordinary how there's so much plasticity in the evolution of species, which means they're so malleable. They can reform and converge into similar forms, even though they don't share recent common ancestors. But this is uh, a group of, of us uh, in the children's forest, and we create these lists that are be available for everyone. And we want to build these lists over time, uh, we will clearly get into several hundred species on Cortez. There's, there's, I would guesstimate there's more than 2,000 species on Cortez. 
Uh, so this is just the beginning uh, very early on of the list that we'll eventually be able to generate. I like showing this, this is a, an image that an artist friend of mine made just talking and show, illustrating the interconnectedness of fungi in, in the forest. Uh, my particular interest in bees and I have a strong uh, focus on polypore mushrooms. These are the wood conchs, artist conchs that you see here, uh, and reishi and agaricon and the red belted polypore. So, and I'm also fascinated by the interaction of, uh, of uh, bears, uh, birds. And one of the interesting little Venn diagrams that's been useful for me to communicate is most people may not be aware that when a red headed pileated woodpecker or any woodpecker, uh, the analysis they've done of fungi in their beaks, they found literally up to about a hundred different species of fungi. So I've always wondered why, why would a woodpecker go up to a tree and start hammering into the tree when there's obviously it's a, it's a healthy tree, there's no insects that are available. Well, what's happening is they're inoculating the tree with fungi and then the mycelium grows and then beetles then come over, which are mycophagous, meaning they, they eat fungi, come in after that mycelium as a nutrient source. Uh, and then, so, and then the woodpeckers come back to harvest the beetles or a beetle larvae. So you can see that nature is a continuum. And indeed, same with bears, bears scratch trees, they become a cav uh, cavity habitats then because of the invasion of fungi or the colonization of fungi. Actually, I'd like to get away from these militaristic terms, not colonization, not mil militarization, but the growing of, of fungi in these habitats then becomes a door that opens for biodiversity. So if you do a Venn diagram of, uh, of fungi, mycologists, uh, birds, uh, ornithologists, uh, beetles, entomologists, you'll see that's intersection. And it's much more even elaborate and complex, but that I think is illustrative uh, that in forced successionism, it opens up uh, the biodiversity of the ecosystem to many other members that are so essential for the health of the forest. So it's a simple, very just elementary mycology here, a cross section of a forest, saprophytic fungi break down wood and other dead material. They're saprophytes, by definition, they're growing on dead material. The endophytic fungi are particularly interesting. You really can't define a plant now without the endophytic fungi inside of it. And so, so many of the medicinal properties heretofore thought to be uh, uh, from plants are actually from the endophytic fungi that are producing unique medicinal compounds inside the plant. The endophytic fungi give a host defensive resistance against pathogens. It's the plurality and the biodiversity of fungi inside of a plant that gives us this sort of resistance. And so these are guilds, these are consortia that are gr growing uh, symbiotically in, inside of a plant or inside of a tree that gives the tree its, and the plants uh, their, uh, a strong state of health. Uh, and then many of these endophytic fungi, you know, uh, when the tree dies, they become saprophytes. So it's really, it, it's become so much more complex. You know, we are, uh, the, the uh, trees are multi-special. We see the structure of a tree, but it really is a giant community of cooperating organisms. The mycorrhizal fungi growing associated with the root zones. I think most of you know about those. And the parasitic fungi uh, kill uh, the trees. But it, you know, with a few exceptions, most of the parasitic fungi uh, uh, take advantage of trees already that have a weakened immune system, either because of habitat stress, uh, pollution, uh, malnutrition, or other things that have happened to it. Uh, so the parasitic fungi oftentimes are are the analogies with a wolf pack going through a herd of, of elk, uh, calling out their weaker ones. So ultimately the, the elk herd is, is stronger and the ecosystem is, is better for, for all. So an excellent uh, book is Mycorrhizal Symbiosis. Uh, the, the cover of the book that you see there, you can see what the root zone, uh, the, the, uh, the rhizome of, of the tree root, but, but that vast network is all mycelium extending the surface area of the absorption of nutrients uh, hundreds of times, uh, giving uh, minerals to the plants in exchange, they, they secrete uh, sugars and other, uh, and other food. And these fungi are communicating. Uh, uh, Suman Samard, a renowned British uh, Columbia mycologist and a good friend of mine, she has 
showing that these mother trees communicate uh, via the mycelial networks. And there's a bi-directional uh, sharing of nutrients even outside of the kin, the, the mother trees uh, uh, kinship uh, domain of benefit extends out to other species. Uh, again, trying to help the biodiversity of the ecosystem because ultimately that's, that serves the commons. So uh, I, Pam and I just came out of the old growth forest just literally about an hour and a half ago in a forest very similar to this. We were surprised to find so many mushrooms, um, but these forests uh, oftentimes are climax in age. And this is one that you all should know is the dire uh, polypore, Phalus schweinitzii. Phalus schweinitzii is very velvety, has many different colors and forms. Um, but a very uh, a dear friend of mine, Miriam Rice, she's a, a pioneer dying with mushrooms, that is the colors of dying. Um, and my good friend, David Summerlin, uh, took this photograph here on the right. And this is some of the colors that you can get from these polypore mushrooms using a mordant um, and very, very hard uh, and for natural to get uh, natural dyes that are colored purple or blue. Uh, and so these, these fungi are great uh, reservoirs of natural dyes, something that I'd love to see more on Cortez Island. And David Summerlin, my good friend who's taught a lot at Hollyhock has done several presentations on this. So now they, they can parasitize a tree, the tree calls down. When, when, when you see Phalus schweinitzii at the base of a tree, if I can go back to this, if this tree is by your house and you see this, this mushroom, you should call an arborist or a, 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 a tree, a, a person to cut down the tree. That, that tree will fall, is a root rot fungus. So the tree may be very statuesque and looking, looking good, but with that, this polypore at the base of a tree, that tree will topple. And could it could endanger you know anything that's that's around it? So just be aware of it. It's a great mushroom. Um, I have no prejudice against it, but if it's by my it's in a tree by my house, I'd be quite concerned. So the trees topple, and <clears throat> one of the more interesting fungi that we found is very common on Cortez is a honey mushroom, Armillaria astoii. Um, there's Armillaria melia, Armillaria gallica. This this Armillaria astoii has been determined. The largest organism on the planet is uh, the honey mushroom. Uh, it's a, a, uh, a acreage in eastern Oregon, uh, uh, over 2,200 acres in size. It's, this, it's the single most uh, largest organism in the world thus far identified, all via its mycelium. But it kills the forest trees, and then it can grow saprophytically. It's a white spore mushroom. You see the white spores there. And one of the things that that uh, Chris and Christine and I and, and, uh, and Sabina, uh, we, we went around and we put identification tags uh, with a Latin binomials and a common name beside uh, the mushrooms that we found. And it really it kind of dawned on us after, uh, afterwards that maybe we should just leave these little flags up. So it becomes a, uh, the forest becomes a teaching force well after we do our mycoblitz so people walk in the forest and go, oh, that's what a honey mushroom looks like. And so we could put QR codes on these and with your iPhone or your droid, you could then get to the QR code. It would then launch you into a story in publications of the largest organism in the world. Um, so I think this is a interesting uh, merging of potential technologies, putting identification tags up, QR codes, and then having it as anybody walking through the forest, the children's forest, they be launched into a larger body of knowledge. We will come back in an appropriate time within a week or two weeks and then um, pull them uh, and recycle them, of course. So also very, very common are turkey tail mushrooms. This is one of Mira Andrews uh, images. Uh, turkey tail mushrooms are one of the most well-studied medicinal mushrooms in the world. We were funded by NIH with our colleagues uh, at the University of Minnesota Medical School and Bastyr uh, Medical College for a 2.2 million dollar uh, breast cancer clinical study that showed a very, very powerful upregulation uh, up regulation of the immune system um, and enhancing natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells. So turkey tail uh, it has a long, long history of use all over the world. And what's so cool about so many of these mushrooms is indigenous peoples in Europe, in South America, in North America, 
um, there is there is a commonality uh, of knowledge, and whether these this knowledge was independently discovered, whether there are threads throughout history because of land migrations, the Polynesians come to North America, or the land bridge of, from Eurasia, um, you know, people carry the skill sets with them as they migrate, give them to their children, to teach others, and so this is uh, the body intellect and knowledge of mushrooms c comes from many different sources and we are we benefit from that so um hygrosomy miniata complex uh was one that we found a lot in the children's forest these are spectacularly beautiful mushrooms they come up sometimes in the hundreds and i just thought i'd throw a few images well how do you identify mushrooms and so i put down a mushroom field guide there that is very accurate and, uh, and uh, you can see the similarity between the wild specimens and that in the field guide. Um, Mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest by Trudeau and Armorati uh, is currently, I believe, the best field guide. Uh, the problem with all these books is they don't cover enough species. So we have to buy all the books uh, uh, to, in order to identify uh, uh, the, the mushroom species. There's not one, any, no one book has enough, uh, has enough species to, to cover. And this is a really common one. It's the most common uh, mushroom on Douglas fir, uh, Strobilurus trussellatus. Um, uh, it's a Douglas fir, you know, a cone mushroom. Uh, this is a really fun one. Also, when you get it really young, you can take it home. You can just watch it grow. Uh, so it's not a parasite. It's growing saprophytically. It's probably adding nutrients though uh, to allow for uh, cone germination. So it's releasing nutrients uh, to help the cones. Uh, then uh, become young trees. Uh, one of the more fun mushrooms that I like uh, showing people is Mycena hematopus. Uh, he uh, hematopus means blood foot. Um, it's a delicate uh, little mushroom, but you squeeze the base of the stem, uh, the stem you can see the, uh, the red juice coming from it. So fortunately, some Latin ma names make sense. Hematopus, blood foot. I like Latin names that make sense. Some of them are very erudite and they're a little bit harder to sort of keep in memory. And then one of the most exciting mushrooms, one of the most exciting mushrooms, the, the top three that we found uh, with Autumn here, she spied it, very difficult to see because it's so dark, is a Leptonia, used to be in the genus Entoloma, uh, Leptonia cerulata. It's known as cerulata because the gills have a very dark margin. Um, this is quite exceptional. Most of the gills of mushrooms, if they have a distinguishable margin, is usually white in color and not uh, dark in color. Edibility unknown. Uh, this, uh, who would collect this mushroom in large enough quantities? We only know the edibility of mushrooms from the prior experiences of people who've eaten them before us, generationally. So uh, this one does not have a history of edibility. We look for poisons into the mushrooms only when uh, people become poisoned. Uh, so there's so many species out there. They're basically like miniature pharmaceutical factories where we have not uh, been able to characterize the, the chemical uh, constituents within these mushrooms, but they're extraordinary. Um, and then here's the three little petite mushrooms um, that I, I, I find these frequently, they co-occur Cisoderma amyothiamin, Lepiota magnospora, and uh, Leuco agaricus rubro tichnoides. I'm not sure if you can see the image, it's a little bit off screen. Um, but these are very, very commonly co occur. Um, and the Lepiotas have a reputation of being poisonous. Um, and again, they're very petite. So who would collect these for food when you have chanterelles, you know, right in the same vicinity? Uh, but nevertheless, Lepiotas seem to harbor some really novel toxins, which have not yet been uh, characterized. So uh, these small lepiotas, there's some big lepiotas that are edible, but these little petite uh, lepiotas are something that, that we caution people against from eating. So a lot of you are familiar with the fly agaric, Amnita muscaria, uh, also known as soma. It's known as the fly agaric because in Europe, um, before the invention of uh, window screens to prevent insects from coming into the house, uh, flies, as you can imagine, be flying in and out of the windows and be a quite great nuisance. It was discovered that this mushroom, when you 
chop it up and put it into milk, which of course without refrigeration goes sour very quickly. And then the mushrooms in the milk on a dish, the flies would come in, they'd sip along the dish edge into the milk that's infused with the fly agaric mushroom, they become stunned and they die. So it's called the fly agaric because it prevented flies from coming into your house. Now, it's also associated with reindeer. Um, uh, there's really good uh, ethnomycological documentation of the use of this mushroom in Siberia by indigenous peoples. Um, it contains three primary chemical uh, toxins or intoxicants. The difference between a toxin and intoxicant is sometimes debatable, but it's muscarin, ebotenic acid, and musimol. Um, and the muscarinic symptoms cause a lot of salivation and, and sweat. We actually, there's very little muscarinic uh, compounds in Amnita muscaria, it's a little bit of a misnumber. But the ebotenic acid in the musimol is very well characterized. Um, and because of their profuse uh, salivation and sweating, literally, I have eaten this mushroom a few times, you're drenched in sweat um, and you salivate. And I ate it when I was very young with a friend of mine and he looked at me and he said, you look like you have rabies, dude. And I said, you do too. And you've got a bubble at the mouth. It's, but it's a very, very poor um, and unexciting and uninteresting um, form of intoxication. It literally is dangerous. Um, no one's died from it, except for some cases potentially of hypothermia because it's like Soma implies, it does put you to sleep. Dolls, yellows and browns. Um, it has a repetitive motion syndrome. That's, that's very much a big concern uh, because people, if they see or witness something that's violent, they can repeat. You can't separate your memory from your action. So when I ate this mushroom and another mushroom, when I dropped my camera, did I, did, did I really drop my camera? Or was that a, a memory of me dropping the camera? I picked up my camera, I dropped it again. I drop it maybe 100, 200 times um, because you get this repetitive motion syndrome. Well, in the indigenous people in, in Eurasia, uh, heart, a herding reindeer discovered that the shamans, when they eat this mushroom, they would pee on the, on the snow and the yellow snow uh, would be attracted to the reindeer who would then consume the yellow snow, become stupefied. Uh, and then you could just put a, a rope around the reindeer and herd them. You didn't have to, chase the reindeer through the snow. So it's very, it was used very uh, well to be able to uh, domesticate reindeer uh, that otherwise would be very difficult to be able to, to go after them you know, in high snow. So there's a lot of history to this. Also it relates to the name berserkers in the Norway. That's where the, the term supposedly came from the berserker uh, people um, and it's the Norwegians you know, le legend has not not proven. The other things with ethnomycology with the Siberians is very well documented. What is not well documented, this legend that these uh, Norwegians were uh, were being uh, decimated the next day, vastly outnumbered. They made a big soup of this amnita muscaria. They ingested it. Uh, and then to the other horror of the invading dominant army, uh, they took off all of their clothes and attacked uh, the surrounding army, uh, and they became these the sort of robotic killing machines. So this, uh, this mushroom is, has really interesting use. Now it can be detoxified. There's a long tradition in Russia and Japan uh, in Eastern Europe of boiling this mushroom in water three times, discarding the water and the mushroom's edible. Uh, but it's not something that I recommend that people do. So this mushroom has a long history of use associated with Santa Claus, as many of you know. Um, but it's a, it's a great species, it's just so beautiful. Um, and it has this property <coughs> of regrowing after you pick it. The mushroom will continue to grow. It can, it can become three or four times bigger, uh, but less dense. But it has negative geotropism. You can harvest this mushroom, pull it out of the ground, put it on a bowl, and it'll continue to grow and expand and actually expand into a full mushroom. Um, under the right conditions. So it's amazing, a lot of mushrooms, you pick them, they stop growing. Uh, several species we know like this one continues to grow subsequent to harvesting. It's a, many of you see it, the fly agaric, amnita muscaria. It's got a yellow form, it's got a white form, um, and uh, amnita muscaria, variety formosa is a yellow form. Uh, and there is a variety alba, which as it implies is a white form. but. Um, and there's another one, 
species that we also find in the children's forest called, called Ammonita franchettii. Uh, edibility uh, unclear, not not recommended. You don't want to be the first person to to determine a mushroom is poisonous. So always make sure that you are going with people and collecting mushrooms with people who have good knowledge of them. And then, uh, and then Michael Vallow, our good friend, is an MD. Does now for about twenty years, and this one is called a, called a, uh, um, the cup at the base. So the, the shrimp brushless are some of the best edible mushrooms. And uh, this is a, a good one to know about. It's a um, really good when it's young. Uh, flies like it, so you have to compete with fly larvae. And then another one, the photograph by Mira, is a brushless species also. It's very similar, but not as purple. And is it hot or not? This is a super hot peppery mushroom. And I like to give it to people and, as part of our mycological tricksters, we ask someone to take a little bite of this mushroom, and, but not swallow it, just bite it. And, and then about 15, 30 seconds later, you just really, really hot uh, a pepper um, sensation occurs. And uh, this is known as Rushla emetica. Emetica means you throw up. Uh, so this is a poisonous mushroom. And bear in mind, very few mushrooms are actually poisonous. Um, the most mushrooms are, just don't taste good. Uh, but the few really poisonous mushrooms are less than a dozen species you can easily memorize. Many of the other mushrooms that are, and the generally the rule of thumb is if you eat a mushroom, you get sick within an hour or so, don't worry about it. You have not eaten a, poison, a deadly poisonous mushroom. If you eat a, a mushroom and you get sick six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours later, you could have entered into a group of alpha ammonites of the deadly ammonitas, and that is a concern. Uh, so we had one example I'll, I'll briefly mentioned here on Cortez Island a few years ago. So Rushla brevipes, brevipes means short foot, again, another good name. Mushrumps is what we oftentimes call them. You can see them, it's very, very common uh, all over Cortez. They push up under the, the duff and they have a dimple uh, in the center. Well, it is parasitized by the, the lobster fungus, Hypomyces lactiflorum. And Rushla brevipes is a very banal, bland mushroom. It's not very good eating. But after it's been parasitized by this hypomyces, by basically this other fungus mold, it turns into this really delicious mushroom. Uh, I have a place at my cabin at Seaford on Cortez Island where I've seen now Rushla brevipes and hypomyces lactiflorum take over it for 10 years in a row. And that was a big surprise for me. It's become perennial. So when you find your lobster mushroom patch, this is a really good thing for you to know. Um, and there's, there's nothing that looks like this. This is a, one of the safest of all edible mushrooms uh, is the lobster mushroom, Hypomyces lactiflorum, parasitizing Russia brevipes. Two more examples of it. In the photograph on the right, you can actually see the gills of Russia brevipes being in a sense denuded uh, by, uh, uh, by this fungus. Now, these are two white amanitas that we have on Cortez Island, Amanita civicula, uh, which is, tends to be very squat, uh, very short stemmed, and Amanita smithiana, or solitaria. Uh, this one is poisonous and unknown toxins. Uh, we did have an event on Cortez Island uh, myself was involved, Dr. Michael Bug was involved, Rocky Mountain uh, Poison Center, a number of other MDs and mycologists were involved. The person on Cortez Island was collecting Matsutake, pine mushrooms, and discovered that they accidentally collected Smithiana. Uh, Smithiana grows by itself, but singularly, so why it's called solitary. A very long taproot does not smell like pine, like a pine mushroom. So the scent of smelling pines is a very important identification thing. This person realized that they did not have a pine mushroom, called us, we determined it was indeed Smithiana, and it became a really interesting case of juxtapositioning the, the safety of the EMTs and search and rescue. It was in November, not, uh, lots of a very heavy storm had come in and we were on the phone for hours trying to figure out what we should do with this person 
uh, we and we made the collective decision that given that they, they I think they I think they purged my memory is right. We had to make the decision. It was more dangerous for the EMTs and search and rescue to come take this person to the hospital than the mushroom likely would be dangerous to the person who ingested it. Uh, from that experience, my heart goes out to doctors and EMTs who have to make life and death decisions. It becomes a really complicated uh, sequence of decisions to make. Fortunately, the person uh, uh, fully recovered and I don't believe uh, had it really any bad symptoms other than appreh apprehension. So be careful about this. We do not know the toxicity of this. Anyone collecting pine mushrooms, smell every one of them. Uh, if it has a tap root like this, um, then uh, you may have solitaria. They co-occur oftentimes within a few feet of each other. Oyster mushrooms are amazingly common uh, on, on Cortez. Uh, the one on the lower left was our place out at Mary's Point. We watched this tree produce hundreds of oyster mushrooms um, and uh, finally the tree broke, uh, but they're delicious edible. They grow a lot in the spring. We saw a lot, a lot this fall. So they go from spring to fall. Oyster mushrooms have a natural form of levastatin, uh, which helps uh, uh, reduce your LDL cholesterol. Um, it's interesting studies on that. Um, it's also one of the most powerful mushrooms for breaking down toxic waste, especially those are hydrocarbon based uh, from petroleum to diesel to um, to, to pesticides and other type of chemicals. Pleurosibella porogens, the angel wings, has been consumed for hundreds of years by people all over the world. We had about eight years ago, a very strange cluster of deaths in Japan with this mushroom as a common denominator with people who had kidney disease, who then suddenly and mysteriously uh, became very sick from consuming this mushroom and died. We have no explanation for this. And so even though in the books it says it's edible, even though people collected it for hundreds of years, now we're trying to say, back off, please be careful in eating this mushroom. We do not, we cannot resolve this cluster of people who died. And if you have kidney disease or, you know, or, or if you have liver disease, you know, the, the, eating wild mushrooms is probably something you need to think twice about. Uh, but Florisabella porogens, the angel wings, I've eaten them a lot. Uh, oyster mushrooms, frankly, I think are better. Uh, but I caution people, you should probably take a break from this mushroom until we figure out what happened to this cluster of people in Japan. Now, foliotas are really beautiful. This is foliota sclerosa adiposa complex. Um, we saw magnificent fruiting. And, and Chris and Christina and Mira and Sabina, I never photographed that tree. This, this is a tree that was 50 feet tall with hundreds of these mushrooms. So if you have that photograph of that tree from the children's forest, I'd love to get a copy of it. Um, but this is a edible mushroom. Um, it's also cultivated around the world. Um, it's, and it's one, one that's not typically collected uh, by people hunting wild mushrooms because most, most people don't know it's edible. And then I'm coming to the close of this presentation. And of course, it's chanterelles. Um, and this is uh, Dr. Pam Crisco, my partner. Um, chanterelles, this is Cantharellus formosus. The, the books say Siberius, but that's a European species. Now we have a new name in a sense for the chanterelles. Um, and the chanterelles come up typically as twins, two at once. Uh, so, the best practices now for harvesting that's been advocated by most experts is that you cut the, the mushrooms, you don't pull them, you cut them so the twin won't be aborted. They oftentimes do not grow simultaneously. You have one large one and you'll have a baby sitting there and you remove the adult and then the baby then can grow up. Over harvesting is indeed a problem. I just saw a report by a very good graduate student um, uh, who's done DNA analyses uh, and with the Belita species in particular and, and one region of Europe, there's been a, a vast decline uh, of the diversity within Belitas due to harvesting. So we do know that over harvesting can it impact, logically it would, uh, but we didn't have the DNA evidence until just, just recently. 
So um, the photograph on the right, which in my view is obscured, but it's a heart of chanterelles. You know, chanterelles are some of the best mushrooms on Cortez and so much fun. And for those who've been out to my, my Mary's Point property, a really important thing to me is mossy roads. I'm in love with mossy roads. When I see chanterelles come up in mossy roads, I, I'm in like ecstasy. And that's why I don't want any of my mossy roads damaged. I want them to keep me as walking meditation paths. And, uh, and so for us mycologists, you know, walking mossy roads, especially as we get older, you know, uh, being able to have an easy walkway to see these, these verdant, beautiful, colorful mushrooms pop up, just, uh, just make this a mycological dream come true for us. So I just want to thank um, all of you, the, uh, especially the, the, the Clues, uh, Mosaic, who owns the, the land currently, Sabina, uh, uh, Chris, Christina, Mira Andrews and her circle of Myconauts. Mira and the Myconauts could be a new band. Um, uh, Autumn and then Pam Crisco. So anyhow, I, I just wanted to end. And also I want to mention on the far lower right is an agaricon that we found out at Seaford uh, on, uh, on the property that I co-own, a bobcat holding. And agaricon is a species that has a long history of use in as Elixirium ad longum vitam, the elixir of long life, the very first Materia Medica 2000 years ago. It's also been used by First Nations in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it, it changes from this brown form to a ghost form. Uh, Nancy Turner has just submitted an excellent manuscript on the ethnomycology of indigenous peoples uh, in the First Nations of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and there's also a long history of First Nation use of this for its anti-inflammatory properties. This is the longest living mushroom in the world, putatively, there's one other species that competes for it. It grows for a hundred years or so. I have 12 strains out of my library of about 75 now from, Agar from Cortez Island. Um, and we've been doing studies of it for a long time. For many of you know, you see my other talks, active against bird flu and other viruses. We have been approved by the FDA for a COVID clinical trial using Agaricon. Um, we, as the University of California, uh, uh, San Diego, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. That's the US website that has all the clinical trials. And you can see our clinical trial there is currently recruiting. It is from the mycelium, not from the mushroom. This is so important to emphasize, do not collect this mushroom unless it's on the ground, it's fallen, or if a logging operation is coming through to cut down the forest. Otherwise, it's so important these things sporulate and spread their microdiversity into the ecosystem. So what we have found recently with Harvard Medical School, working with the Alzheimer's Institute, is that agaricon is extremely potent anti-neuroinflammatory properties. And so part of our COVID clinical trial, we have six patients that have gone through successfully it's, a call, it's called a sentinel study by the FDA. And now we're recruiting 132 people for the full-fledged study. It's the long haulers. Subsequent to COVID infection, even though you resolve you know, from the short disease period of COVID, the neuroinflammatory impacts of COVID looks like they're, it's extremely serious. And it could be decades, uh, remove decades from your life. Uh, is one estimate of reducing uh, IQ by more than 20%. Star athletes become mediocre athletes. So the neuroinflammatory consequences of COVID is something that Agaricon is really in a sweet spot. We hope of being able to help uh, patients uh, uh, better, better uh, survive. So again, to please do not collect them. We, <coughs> we take a photograph of them. We have a geotag on them. Many of you see I take a cork board, a piece of the size of my little fingernail. Uh, I get it in the culture, we leave the conch there. Uh, the, big, the big tree at Trudeau's Cafe by the gorge, that huge conch, thankfully we, we got that in the culture before a storm broke off the top and it smashed and then apparently it was um, discarded. So I'm very much passionate about studying agaricon and, and all of its diversity uh, throughout the Pacific Northwest. And we have strains from Austria, Italy, uh, in Slovenia as well. So we're doing a very big a genomic uh, on agaricon. So we're publishing a paper next, uh, 
uh, year on the genomic uh, microdiversity of agaricon uh, throughout the world. So I'll be glad to take a few uh, a few questions. Um, and um, thank you very much for your time.